I think that we finished 27, chapter 27 of, <clears throat> of um, Jeremiah, and uh, we're ready to move to 37, <clears throat> and I want to make quick work of 37, um, but um, <clears throat> uh, because I'd like to see if we could move on a little bit here. So this is Jeremiah 37, okay? And uh, beginning with verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> and King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, which actually is uh, uh, Jehoiachin, and um, whom, uh, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. And neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, I'm sure they heard him, but which he spake by the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, so a new king's taken over, <clears throat> and it's fixing to be the wrap-up, because this is the last king that, uh, uh, that Israel, that Judah will have until Jesus becomes that king, in truth. <clears throat> so, um, and uh, so I'll just read this. In verses 1 through 3, we have the new king of Judah taking the same stance that the others did, the other three that were before him or two. <clears throat> they refuse to believe that God's way is the way of the lamb um, and, and lamb-type sufferings and willing weakness, but hold to the wisdom of the world concerning might and power. So, Pretty much the whole book of Jeremiah has this as a running theme behind it. Now, uh, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. There are a lot of other issues going on with God and with them. There's individual sins. There's corporate sins of the priesthood. There's this and that. And God's upset about all that, too. <clears throat> but, but the one thing that he is trying to do is that he's trying to use Babylon and he calls him his servant and he calls him his hand, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king. Uh, and he says they need to submit and not fight this. And of course, you remember the, everything that we're saying, but the whole thing is they're going, no, we're not going to fight. We're, I mean, we're not going to submit. We're going to we're going to stand up for God and we're going to fight and we're going to defeat him because God is with us. And, you know, all this stuff, all this stuff that is not according to his spirit. But, you know, and this goes all the way back to these times. Well, it goes back further than that. But um, so that's the that's the issue. And uh, <clears throat> so verse three and Zedekiah, the king sent Jehuchel the son of Shealtimiah, and uh, Zephaniah, the son of Maaseiah, <clears throat> the priest of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, so, so the king's sending this, this, this guy, messenger, to Jeremiah, and he says, pray now unto the Lord our God for us. Okay, so the whole time Jeremiah's been a, a black sheep. He's been hated because he keeps saying, "Thus saith the Lord: Stop fighting and and uh, <clears throat> uh, release the spirit of the lamb, and everything will be all right." But it, but you know, if you don't, if you can't do that, you're going to fight. That's just the way we are. If you can't have that spirit, if even if you're not doing it outwardly, you'll do it anyway. Well, well, isn't that? And you'll do, and then you'll react over this, and then all this kind of stuff. And um, you know, uh, I mean, that gets into a whole area of stuff that I really don't want to get into right now. That does have some things from the Lord, but uh, God's heart. God's heart is that we learn this spirit and can live it in the tribe. That's the thing. And release it. And in doing that release, things will begin to come into order and God will move and bless. And he, and he did. I mean, you've got, you've got Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and uh, those guys. And you, you see how blessed they were. Even in captivity, they, they were not struggling with the captivity, you know, so much, at, maybe at the first. But, but you know, 
they eventually were with the spirit of what the Lord was. <clears throat> so, um, so they sent, so the king sends the new king who knows the other kings because their family, his family, <clears throat> sends to uh, Jeremiah and says, pray for us, you know. And he's saying, pray, you know, pray and find out what the mind of the Lord is. <clears throat> well, he knows what Jeremiah is going to say, but deep down he knows that Jeremiah is of God. And he knows that he hears from God, but he doesn't like what he, what he says. <laughs> he, likes, he likes, you know, it's like, I mean, it really is like he likes Jeremiah. He, he saves Jeremiah from a horrible uh, prison thing to put him into another prison thing closer to the king that isn't near as bad as the other one. I mean, it seems like, you know, he really likes him on a lot of fronts, but doggone it, Jeremiah, why do you keep saying this stuff that seems so contrary to human nature? Well, it's because it's not your nature or mine. It's his. It's the lamb's. All right. <clears throat> uh, pray for us. Pray now unto the Lord our God for us. Now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him in prison. <clears throat> um, so, um, well, I wrote, in light of that, though Jeremiah is the man with the contrary message, yet the king believes he is more of a man of God than others, and so he asks him to pray for them. Of course, the king means that he should pray for deliverance from these sufferings ordered of God and from Nebuchadnezzar, Everybody thinks God exists for one purpose, to save them from our, our, any discomfort, especially if it means any loss to us. So verse 5, Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans uh, uh, that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Okay, <clears throat> so now this looks like, see, all of, you know, I should probably read my notes here, but <laughs> let me just do that. Because I'm trying to get past this. I'm trying to get into a little more here. Then the Egyptian army shows up unexpectedly and chases off Babylon, chases off Nebuchadnezzar and his people, his army. What does this do for the heart of Judah? Now they have supposed, supposed proof that their way of thinking is right and that Jem Jeremiah is a false prophet. See? God sent Pharaoh here and the Egyptians and chased away. They got scared and ran away. And now, can you imagine the, the party that happened immediately after that? Um, now they have supposed proof that their way is, okay, I said that. They also have a new hope that God is with them and he must have sent the Egyptians, but they are wrong. So here I quoted John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And here we have the most basic scripture of Christianity. And what is it a picture of? It is of Jesus dying. Jesus going, see, we say, well, God saved us and God so loved us that he, he you know, gave his only begotten Son. He, 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 sent his son to be the lamb when they wouldn't be. And he died for all that was wrong about them. And so we hold on to that scripture, our whole Christian life. But 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16 says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God, for God so loved. Hereby perceive we the love. Not We can see that love that God has. We need to see the one he wants us to have. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay, so I wrote, it's time we get past John 3.16 and read a little further in the Bible. <laughs> Just... It, It'd be good if we read a little further into it uh, and find that there's a progression. 
just like God made the earth and God made it where uh, people would uh, have children and that little child would be just a baby that needed care and giving for it, but eventually it's supposed to grow up and become an adult and not just be self-centered about everything. Well, <clears throat> Christianity. A whole lot of it is still just help me do this for me, bless me, take care of me. You know what? If if a if a set of parents continued that attitude, let's say they got married young, so they're they're young and they're going, hey, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I just want to be free. I want you know this and that, and so then they start having kids, and they keep acting like kids themselves and children, like. Well, you children are taking away all my joy, and I'm having to always, you know, who's always having to give up their time? Me, you know. You don't even understand parenthood at all, man. You, it's all about giving and losing and helping. And, and if you're in pain and they're in pain, you forget your pain and you take care of their pain and all this kind of stuff. It's a, it's a completely different thing. God made it where everybody could see that progression. But in Christianity, we can't seem to see that progression. It's still, bless me, help me. You know, we've become the object of blessing and have never become the channel of blessing of him to others and, and him through us. And not, not just Jesus doing it, but Jesus's nature uh, through us that doesn't have to go, look what I did, you know, and somebody needs to Somebody needs to uh, make a big deal out of this and give me an award for what I did or whatever, but no, no, no. It's not about that anymore. It's about him. All right, so. Uh, so now the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah since Zedekiah asked to hear, you know, pray, pray for us and hear from from the Lord for us. What's the Lord saying? <clears throat> then came this verse 6. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, <clears throat> Thus shall you say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me to inquire of me. So it's like God knows that he's, I mean, it's like God's watching this whole thing. God goes, okay, so he's the new king and and he's going to do a smart thing. He's going to go ask Jeremiah what he thinks or what he's heard because, you know, he, he believes really Jeremiah has something even though he's the worst prophet in the world because he never says what we want him to say. But still, I have a feeling that he thinks, he, you know. So, so the Lord says that sent you unto me to inquire of me. This is God saying, look, uh, this is what I have to say to you to tell him because he sent you unto me, and this is this is it. Okay. <clears throat> Behold, Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. You know, I mean, Jeremiah went, <laughs> the guy called him the messenger and he followed him there. He heard from the Lord. He goes, okay, here's the deal. You remember what I said to your father or grandfather? I've, I lose track of their relationships. But anyway, to, to uh, Je uh, Jehoahaz and uh, to um, uh, Jehoiakim, <clears throat> um, all of your relatives before you, um, no, you know, I can see Zedekiah and go, no, you know, and Jehoiachin. No, what did he say? He said he's going to burn this place down. He's sick of what's going on here and he's going to burn it down, okay? Um, but he's going to bring you into captivity. It's the same story. He, if you will submit, then, you know, the early one was if you'll submit to the to the king of Babylon, you won't have to go into captivity. You'll 
You can stay in your own land. But no, you didn't do that. You pushed it and you pushed it and you pushed it. So now you're going to have to go into captivity. And there you won't, there's no wiggle room. You will either learn me or you'll be a bitter old person when you die in that foreign land. Which happens to Zedekiah in a horrible way. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so he says that and he says, you know, um, <clears throat> he'll come and fight against it because they're going to fight and take it and burn it with fire. <clears throat> okay. Um, so God has already seen their reaction. Their reaction was, yeah, you know, yay, people going out into the streets, you know, and they got banners or whatever, and yeah, you know, the, the kind of rejoicing that they they do and dancing and you know um, uh, oh yeah you know and all of the joy and everything yes God sent Pharaoh and his armies and Babylon was scared and he ran Nebuchadnezzar all right. So the Lord says, you know, no, they're going to leave the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that, that, that's another name for them, they're going to come back. But there's more to this word. And this word is God who, who saw their reaction, who saw their party, who heard their rejoicing as if he sent Pharaoh and their rejoicing over Egypt, and he really gets mad. Okay, so here's what he says. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, deceive not yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For though ye had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans, that fight against you, and there remain but wounded men among them, yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. This is God. This is God's word. And it's and he this is a lot stronger in a certain sense because he saw what happened and he saw their reaction and and, and so so let me just say that um, we're going to uh, make a foray into some more scriptures if we get the time tonight. And we're going to see, uh, we're, well, we're going to get into them. And I'm going to ask you to see if you can see what the issue is and what is so made God irate that he wasn't that irate before. And see if you can tune in, okay? And it's all along the same spirit of what we've been sharing in this class and so many other classes. Okay, my notes uh, at that, at the end of verse 9, and that's all we're going to go to here. <clears throat> but then came the word of the Lord, leave it to Jeremiah to spoil the fun. Because they're partying. First, he points out that though the king had sought his prayers, yet he has not changed his stance. You, you act like you're, you're humble. You're calling on Jeremiah. I want to hear the word of the Lord. But you're not. You're not in any kind of place to do that. Uh, verse 10 shows how important it would be to him if they would be with him in his way, in this way, and how he will feel toward them if they treat his nature as a horrid thing instead of a sacred thing. In other words, he's wanting to get that spirit out of them, to bring forth that lamb spirit, that nature of the lamb. And uh, they're doing everything. The, there's a process we saw it. We saw it in uh, First Peter. You'll see it major, major, in the Book of Revelation, major. Um, and we've we've seen it here. Uh, and I'm not intentionally weaving all this together. The Holy Spirit's doing it. <clears throat> um, uh, they are. Uh, let's see. 
it shows how, verse 10 shows how important it would be to him if they would be with him uh, in this way and how he would feel towards them if he treats his nature as a horrid thing instead of a, a sacred thing and so they're going well, we don't want this spirit you know and they you know they just see it as some sort of a, a sissy i don't know that's a texas way of looking at it but you know just a sissy that won't fight or you know a weak person you know uh you know who's a bookworm and has no muscle or something I, I, just that's the way they see it god sees it as get my son formed in you because that's what matters to me that's what the lord would say okay so when when the king calls him and asks for this you know and then there's this egyptian thing that happens and then everybody's totally back into the old way of seeing and thinking and going yeah this is god Jeremiah's a false prophet. This is what God's like. And God comes back and said, man, if you defeated every one of them till there was nothing but wounded men in their tents, they would rise up and burn this city and send you into captivity. I can kill a bunch of you. So you've, you've, my, my point is, is that you can feel you can feel in the Lord that there's something. Now, what we should do is not not get our mentality and lines, whether if our if our lines are more like Judah that doesn't even comprehend these things, but they should because their whole life has been nothing but slaughtering lambs to take care of situations. Right? Lamb after lamb after lamb feast after feast, eating lamb, and they don't get it? Okay. So, um, the Lord is, is um, reacting, but what we should be doing is not just thinking God is um, just like a human reacting, like us, But there's something, there is something really important that we're about to delve into. Okay? All right. So, um, all right. so we're going to go, even though we uh, only have a little bit of time, we're going to go into chapter 46. So if you got your Bible there, and I always read it, but if you got your Bible... Jeremiah 46, <clears throat> so what, what we're going to do here is, and again, there's a lot of verses here, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to get into 46, and as far as us and our class and the way the Lord, I really feel, wants to lead us is that once we get with done with 46, we're going to go into Isaiah. Uh, we're just going to go there because there's, a, even though that was way earlier and they weren't dealing with Babylon, they were dealing with Assyria, you're going to see the exact same situation going on same spiritual thing going on all right uh so we're going to go there and then we're going to come back we're not going to stay in isaiah long then we're going to come back and we're going to get into ezekiel and ezekiel is going to blow the lid <laughs> off of this thing because jeremiah was meant for a certain portion of this thing but ezekiel is meant to bring in this heart of God that relates to the, the things that are really off. Okay. All right. Jeremiah 46. Uh, the word of the Lord, which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river 
Euphrates and uh, I, I know this word and I'm, uh, Carchemish is what it is. That's how they pronounce it. <clears throat> um, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. There is... Um, now, we were in 37, and now we're in 46. And again, there's a lot of other issues that are dealt with in these, script, in these scriptures. But this is, a, this is the main thread of Jeremiah, is this thing about Babylon and submitting to it. <clears throat> but we get here close to the ending chapters, and we find that this whole chapter here is about Egypt. And as you see, um, it's against the Gentiles, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Nico uh, of Egypt. And um, so here's what he says in verse 3 through 6. Order ye the buckler, he's talking to Egypt, order ye the buckler and shield and draw near to battle. Harness the horses and get up ye horsemen, and stand forth with your helmets, furbish the spears, and put on the big uh, brig brigandines. <clears throat> Wherefore have I seen them dismayed and turned away back? He's talking now still to Egypt. Wait, you put on all that armor. Why? Wherefore have I seen them dismayed and turned back. Verse 5. And their mighty ones are beaten down. Their mighty ones are beaten down <clears throat> and are fled apace and look not back for fear was round about, saith the Lord. Let not the swift flee away nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. And usually when it's talking about the north in these prophecies, <clears throat> it's talking about Babylon. Okay, that's who it's talking about. But you, you still have Assyria in there because it's north also. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Okay, so this was my little intro to chapter 46. <clears throat> it appears that because <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar's army fled when the Egyptians showed up, because we read that in, in chapter 37, it appears that because Nebuchadnezzar's army fled when the Egyptians showed up, that Judah decided that Egypt was their answer to avert the corridor of sufferings, to avert this the captivity okay since jeremiah knows the heart and the word of god he will be thoroughly against anyone interfering with god with uh, almighty god's plan concerning his people taking on his image from verse one we see that jeremiah 46 contains woes written to egypt from god they appear, uh, they are not written because, in general, God hates Egypt. Okay, that, this is, that's an important point. This is specific. This is not because God just, in general, hates Egypt. All right? But because of, a much, much, big, because of much bigger reasons, he speaks directly to Egypt through a foreigner through Jeremiah the Jew. He sent, God sent Jeremiah the Jew to talk to Pharaoh Necho and, and tell him that they are doomed, if you will. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, now I'm referring back to verse 3 through 6. Above it mentions Egypt's mighty weapons. 
They themselves are called mighty ones, verse 6. There are so many of them, verse 7, there are so many of them. Verse 7 says, Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. So, um, they're called the mighty ones. They, 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 God lists all their weapons and stuff. And uh, there are so many of them. And I wrote, remember that Israel turned back from entering what God prepared because of these two issues. That there were, there were uh, men as giants and we are as grasshoppers. And they have walled cities and all of this and we will not enter. Now, y'all also know, probably almost every one of you know this, they didn't enter in because they said they're trying to protect their children. You know how I know that? Because you were here listening to the thing playing just before I came in. That was not planned, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so, so keep in mind that um, God was upset, got really upset, didn't he? He got really upset with them at um, Kadesh Barnea when they wouldn't enter into the land and made their children their excuse. And he got upset, so upset, he said, you will wander your, your Christian life, <laughs> your religious life, you will wander for 40 years and you'll never enter the land. I will watch each of you drop and die in this wilderness and the sun bleach your bones. That's what he says. Okay. <clears throat> That's another example of there's something here. There's something here. You know, it, it would be like, it would be like if I had a really good father when I was growing up, which I didn't, but if I did, if I had a really, really good father that wasn't an alcoholic, <clears throat> and he was a good man, and he, <clears throat> he loved his kids, and he loved his wife, our mom, and we were blessed in so many ways that we could not never even, you know, he was thoughtful and did this and that. But every once in a while, something would happen and he would get really upset. And it was like, gosh, you know, he just hardly ever really gets like this. So, you know, as a kid, you go, I think I want to find out exactly what, what I'm doing that brings that out of him. You know, or a wife maybe would even do this, think that. <clears throat> well, okay, children, husbands, wives, that's fine. That's all a shadow. The scriptures say that's a shadow. It's a shadow of Christ in the church. There's something more important than our husband or our wife or our children, and that is the Lord and his family and his heart and his bride and that that whole area. But we miss all of that because we're so busy focusing on ours. And he knows we're focusing on a shadow and saying that's more important than what he calls important. So, um, Egypt boasts covering the earth. And Judah believes it. Okay. They believe it. But they believe it in a positive way. They believe it in a positive way. Yet it will be a terrible defeat by the Babylonians. Egypt will be destroyed. All right. I'm about to read your first hint. Okay. Just one line. Jeremiah knows that Egypt is an intrusion to Adonai. Yeah. To 
Adonai. All right, let's now, let's go to verse 7 and 8. Who is this? This is God still speaking. Who is this that cometh up as a flood? <laughs> this is God speaking. But you got to remember, there's a little Jew guy named Jeremiah talking to Pharaoh Necho about it. <clears throat> okay. Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Okay, God begins to speak of Egypt's pomp and pride, which is the opposite of what he seeks his people to be formed after. Okay, <clears throat> so verse 9 through... You know, we, we're doing pretty good here. I mean, I don't think we'll finish this, but verse 9 through 10, it's still, still Jeremiah speaking God's word. Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord, God of hosts. He's saying, come on, Egypt, come on. Because this is the day of Adonai. Adonai of hosts. The Lord God of hosts. A day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour and it shall be <clears throat> satiated and made drunk with their blood for the Lord Adonai hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. All right. Some of you may know the history of what this is talking about. And he's saying, Jeremiah's saying, the Lord's saying, yeah, come on up. Come on up. Come on up and fight against the Chaldeans. You ran them off before, but that was a that was a fluke. But I'm not going to tell you how drastic that was yet until you know the real reason of what's going on with God. All right. So so this is Adonai speaking here. It is not a day of vengeance for what Egypt did to Babylon. It is not a day of vengeance for what Egypt did to Judah, or would do. Not a, it's not a vengeance for what Egypt will do to either Babylon or Judah. It is the offense to God, and specifically to Adonai. Okay? Um, <clears throat> For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, the day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour. This is an affront to God in a mammoth way, and I'm telling you right now, we, we're, we're not going to get into it tonight. But this relates to every one of us, and especially those of us who, well, it relates to every one of us, but it should have incredible impact upon those of us who are growing in the understanding of Adonai. Because this is going to be a portion that is completely different from anything we've talked about before. And yet, um, uh, and let me just say this, we're going to see, we're going to see examples of this here, and we're going to see examples, as I said in Isaiah, but Ezekiel, Ezekiel is going to bring the house. <laughs> He's going to bring the house, and it pertains to us who are who are going through the corridor of sufferings. All right. Um, so verses 11 through 12, and I'm glad we're at least moving through these verses. <clears throat> Go up into Gilead and take 
balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. So he's still talking to Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. Meaning there's, you can try to cure yourself, but there will be no cure for Egypt. They won't be totally annihilated, but I'll just say it at this stage. There will be no cure for what happens to them after this battle. Okay. Um, verse 12, the nations have heard of thy shame. This is Now, this is the fore, foretelling of what's coming. The nations uh, have heard of thy shame, and thy cry hath filled the land. For the mighty man hath stumbled against the mighty, and they are fallen both together. And he's not talking about uh, one army against the other. He's talking about them literally falling into each other. <clears throat> Verse uh, 20. Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction cometh. It cometh out of the north. That's Babylon. Okay. Also, her hired men are in the midst of her like fatted bullocks. Okay. I want you to notice that little phrase. Also, her hired men. Okay. It's going to be very important. It's going to be real important understanding Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, <clears throat> are in the midst of her like fatted bullocks, for they also are turned back and are fled away together. They did, they did not stand, because the day of their calamity was come upon them and the time of their visitation. Okay? Um, okay. Uh, I need to... to, 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 to I do need to stop because um, we do have another class coming. And I don't want to do what I did last time. Well, I don't mind doing what we did last time because we sought the Lord. But um, this Revelation class is indeed... I just ask you to keep your hearts open and really try to hear because there's a clear-cut flow of facts and realities that go through that and try to try to hear the main theme of what's being said instead of the beast and what kind they are and trying to figure out who's what and this and that because they're because there's so much scrambled with all of the the imagery that's throughout that that you can lose sight of the lamb and him being all the way through it. And when it's not directly him, it's him in others. So anyway, uh, you, you are truly going to love or hate, <laughs> love what we're about to get into in this class. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take whole books, you know, um, to really press this new point that we're making right now. It's a new point. Uh, the point. Let me just. I'm sorry. I'm taking a little bit of time. But the point up to now has been Judah and Babylon, and God is saying Babylon is my tool my instrument and you need to submit because if you don't you're not submitting to me and they're going no and they don't see it like that they see it as the devil or something else so they're not going to and so they fight against it that's what we've studied up to this point but tonight we've opened a new front of understanding Adonai and and also explaining really big parts in Jeremiah that we can go back to, but, but Ezekiel is going to say them plainly so that you'll, you'll probably remember in Jeremiah and go, oh my God, we were already hearing this. Father, we just love you. 
Father, I just pray for this next class that your spirit will be upon them. And, oh, Holy Spirit, how will we know anything? How would we even be able to receive it? Just like Judah, how would we be able to receive it? So many of Judah, most of Judah fought you, Lord. But we have your Holy Spirit. Convict us, show us, show us in the scriptures, show us in your heart that you have a, a plan that is strictly designated by the slaughtered lamb. And it's hard for us to see because we're strong in ourselves and we're strong in our beliefs and we're strong in our ways. And we need to humble ourselves. We need to get low and just say, Lord, let me see Jesus the way he really is to you. Father, I ask that you put that in their heart. And if they do that in sincerity, you'll, you'll eventually show them. But let these classes be more than classes. May they be May they be carried on the wings of the dove. In Jesus' name, amen.